In this video, we'll talk about the Phillips curve and the connection between theory and data. In the long run, inflation and unemployment are unrelated. The inflation rate depends mainly on growth of the money supply, while the natural rate of unemployment on the process of job search and the frictions in the labor market, like minimum wages, efficiency wages, and so forth. The aggregate demand, aggregate supply model can explain why there is a short-run trade-off between inflation and unemployment. We, we'll call that trade-off the Phillips curve. During the 1960s, the data supported the idea of the Phillips curve. During that era, fiscal policy was expansionary, in part to finance the Vietnam War. To keep interest rates low, the Fed made monetary policy expansionary as well. As a result, aggregate demand grew over the 1960s, tracing out an almost perfect empirical relationship between inflation and unemployment. We can use the aggregate demand, aggregate supply model to explain this empirical relationship. To start a starting point, suppose that the price level equals 100 this year. If aggregate demand next year is low, reflecting, for example, slow money growth, then outcome A will occur. In outcome A, the price level is 103 next year, so the inflation rate from this year to the next equals to 3%. Output, Y1, is relatively low, so unemployment is relatively high, at 6%. If instead, if aggregate demand next year is relatively high, reflecting, for example, rapid money growth, then outcome B will occur. In outcome B, the price level is 105 next year, so calculating it, the inflation rate is equal to 5%. Output Y2 is higher, so the unemployment is lower at 4%. As the aggregate demand shifts, it moves the short-run equilibrium along the short-run aggregate supply curve. These short-run equilibria translate into a negative relationship between the unemployment and inflation rates on the graph to the right. In the short run, the, short, the Phillips curve is the same idea depicted in the short-run aggregate supply curve, but translated to a different graph. Now, let's look at this relationship from the perspective of a policymaker. Since fiscal and monetary policy affect aggregate demand, the Phillips curve appears to offer policymakers a menu of choices, either low unemployment with high inflation or low inflation with high unemployment or anything in between. Many believe that the Phillips curve was stable and reliable as evidenced by the data collected in the 1960s. Well, let's find out what happens next. In the face of what many considered overwhelming evidence for the stability of the downward sloping Phillips curve, Friedman and Phelps, working separately, boldly asserted that any trade-off would be purely temporary. What was their logic? The classical dichotomy and the vertical long-run aggregate supply curve. As the economy reaches the long run, price expectations will adjust the short-run aggregate supply curve and start the economy self-correcting cycle. Eventually, we will reach the natural level of unemployment and the negative correlation with inflation will disappear. The theoretical representation of this idea is the vertical long-run Phillips curve. Just like the long-run aggregate supply curve, the long-run Phillips curve depicts the classical dichotomy. There is no relationship between nominal variables, inflation, and real variables, the unemployment rate. The greater the expansion of the money supply, the faster aggregate demand will shift to the right, resulting in larger increases in prices, or higher inflation. But this higher inflation will not produce lower unemployment. In the long run, unemployment always goes to its natural rate, whether inflation is high or low. In the long run, faster money growth only causes faster inflation. So let's use this model to replicate the data during the 1960s and use it to predict what would happen as the economy self-corrects. The economy is initially at the short-run equilibrium A, 
as fiscal and monetary policy expand aggregate demand, the economy moves along the Phillips curve towards the short-run equilibrium B. The path between A and B is precisely what we see in the data from the 1960s. As the economy starts self-correction towards the new long-run equilibrium, price expectations will shift the short-run aggregate supply curve to the left. This, of course, translates into a shift of the Phillips curve, but to the right. The economy starts moving toward the new long-run equilibrium, C. The path of the economy, moving from A to B to C, is the pattern we would look for in the data to validate the theory of Phelps and Friedman. From 1969, to 1973, inflation and unemployment both increased. People were adjusting their expectations of inflation upward, causing the Phillips curve to shift to the right. The path of the economy in this graph is consistent with our theoretical hypothesis in the previous slide. I can superimpose here in blue and say that perhaps this was point A, this was point B, and this one is point C. Fearman and Phelps' work was looking increasingly convincing to economists and others. To summarize, in the 1960s, there was evidence of a negative relationship between inflation and unemployment, but that relationship was temporary. In the long run, there is no relationship between the two variables. The key is that firms and households adjust their expectations as we approach the long run and return the economy to its long run path. Let's formalize this idea using mathematical notation. This equation is essentially the equation for the short-run aggregate supply curve translated into the unemployment and inflation space. The coefficient a is a positive number that measures the relationship between unexpected inflation and deviations from employment and its natural rate. A 1% increase in inflation causes the unemployment um, to fall by the value of A for any given values of the natural rate as is an expected inflation. If the Fed, for instance, wants to reduce unemployment below its natural rate, it has to surprise people with higher than anticipated inflation. So this difference right here will be positive. The results, of course, is going to be a lower unemployment, but only until people adjust their expectations to the new reality of higher inflation. Eventually, expectations catch up to reality, and this difference right here goes to zero. People see that inflation is higher than they expected, so they adjust their expectations upward. Once this difference in parentheses reaches zero, the unemployment rate is going to be equal to the natural rate of unemployment. Now, there's a lot to unpack here, so let's work through an example. In this active learning exercise, what I'd like you to do is I would like you to plot the long run Phillips curve according to the information I've given you and find the unemployment rate for each of these values of actual inflation rate. Essentially, what I'm asking you is to graph these two points on the Phillips curve axes. I'm giving you inflation of 0 and 6%. Find the corresponding values of unemployment given these numbers up here. Once you do that, you have at least two points there. And since our Phillips curve is a straight line, you can just draw a straight line through those two points. Then in B and in C and D, I want you to conduct an experiment. So from the numbers up here on top, I want you to increase expected inflation to 4% and redraw that Phillips curve. And again, going from 
those numbers above, I want you to instead now suppose that the natural rate falls to 4% and redraw the graphs. Uh, there will be some um, responses for you to uh, put on top hat, so don't forget to do that. All right, so let's look uh, at the answers. So here's the long run Phillips curve. Again, we can find that by drawing a straight vertical line through the natural rate of unemployment. And the first one, um, the Phillips curve in the short run for scenario B, is this downward sloping curve that crosses at the unemployment rate at three and six and zero inflation rate and six unemployment rate. In, an increase in expected inflation shifts the, uh, the Phillips curve to the right and compared to the initial scenario, a fall in the natural rate is going to shift both curves to the left. Remember, because the Phillips curve in the short run has um, the unemployment, the natural rate of unemployment at one of its components, it will shift too when that uh, changes. Now let's talk about one last shifter of the Phillips curve. Because the Phillips curve is just a short run aggregate supply in different clothes, supply shocks that shift the short run aggregate supply curve will also shift the Phillips curve. Let's go back to the 1970s and early 1980s to examine the oil price shocks in the context of the Phillips curve. In 1973, OPEC colluded to raise the price of oil to historic heights. The Fed chose to accommodate the first shock in 1973 with faster money growth. The result was higher than expected inflation. In 1979, oil prices surged again, shifting the Phillips curve further to the right. So let's go and analyze this from the theoretical side and show how the data corresponds to our theory. Graphically, an adverse supply shock will shift the short-run aggregate supply to the left, moving the short-run equilibrium from A to B. From the perspective of the Phillips curve, this is a shift to the right from A to B. So keep that in mind as we go and look at the data. The path of inflation and the unemployment rate in this graph is incredibly difficult to interpret. The theoretical model in this case will help us understand this confusing path during this period. Now, let's overimpose the theoretical model in this illustration. Let's suppose that the natural rate of unemployment is usually at 6%, and we're going to call that the long run. Phillips curve. And let's suppose that the short run Phillips curve was around that, let's call that short run Phillips curve, around that area during these years. As you can see, the shock in 1973 shifted the short run Phillips curve. to the right. And that moved us along this path from 1973 to 1974. Now this unexpected increase in prices through the supply shock led to some adjustment of the expectations about inflation in the future potentially shifting the Phillips curve even further to the right. As this was happening, the economy traced this path over to 1975. Now things started to stabilize and we were going back uh, to the short run Phillips curve too. as inflation was decreasing over that period in response to that shock uh, from 1975 to 1976. 
and the accommodation of this shock by increasing money supply was shifting aggregate demand to the right. As aggregate demand was shifting to the right, the economy moved along the Phillips curve through 76, 77, 78, and 79. At this point, the second shock happens, and let's do that in orange, and it shifted the Phillips curve to the right again. And the economy moving from 1979 to 1980 and 1981 trace that path as the short run Phillips curve was shifting to the right. So as you can see, we can make this very complicated path of the economy in this graph be consistent with what we know about our theoretical models. And our theoretical models can help us explain what happened to the economy during the oil crisis. Similarly, we can gain confidence that the model can predict future economic behavior in similar scenarios. In 2020, we've had a large shock to oil prices, with the price of oil reaching negative territory. We can use this model to speculate what is happening in the economy and guide us to, better, to make better choices in the future.